Good afternoon. We're recording in the afternoon today, and welcome to these podcasts as we are doing a series that we're putting out both on Love Thy Number and Presence. So, hello, everyone, and hello, Doug. And hello, Danae. <laughs> are you doing well today? I am doing very well. And why we are not a weather report station. What a difference a day makes, right? Ooh, wow, boy, it is perfecto mundo in Hotlanta today, a high of 70 degrees, sunny skies, no clouds. And yesterday? It, wait, it's Ooh, what, if yeah. we used to watch um, Austin Powers? Yes. He said, it's freaking freezing. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right, and that's what yesterday was in Atlanta. So we are warm today. We're yeah. we're hot. We're warmed up for this, and I want to start off by saying this is what we're calling part two of the deceitfulness of good. Now, let me just say, if you did not listen to part one, you just might want to do that because part two will make a lot more sense. So, babe, Doug, sorry, babe. Hey, That's babe. okay. That's all right. I'm I'm on a lot of podcasts, and I'm I'm used to be calling that. You're a lot of people. To... A lot of people say "babe" when they're when I'm on a podcast with them. You're loved by all. Yes. So why don't you uh-huh. take us back a little bit, and then kind of pick up where we left off because there was a lot that we did not get to. Right, because what we're talking about from the perspective of the enneagram, and from the perspective of of spiral dynamics is human consciousness and our worldviews and our individual perspectives. And we're talking about these things in light of transformation because we are, as humans, transformational beings. We're constantly evolving, constantly growing. Now, in some cases, it might be regression even, but we're changing, transforming it at, at all times. And so it's all happening from a standpoint of our consciousness. What you think about, you bring about all those kinds of things. So when we're talking about that, the question is, how would we think about the growth evolution of consciousness with regard to myself individually and with regard to worldviews? And that's why we bring in both the Enneagram and the spiral. And one model I didn't really talk about last week, Danae, was the quadrants which is used in integral theory quite a bit. And it is to provide a very simple map. Literally, you're drawing uh, an inter- two intersecting lines to make four quadrants. And the upper two quadrants relate to the individual, and the lower two quadrants would relate to a collective. So in the upper two quadrants, the upper left side would be the internal consciousness of the human being, and the right upper quadrant would be the external, which would be like the human brain, a place where neurologists would work, uh, people that are working on the outside. Whereas on the inside, that's where therapists would work, or we would investigate, as we will in this series, the Enneagram, because that's part of my individual perspective, and there are nine perspectives that you're going to go through. Now, on the bottom, there are two quadrants there, and on the lower left is the inside of the collective. The inside of the collective is a worldview, Mm -hmm. and that's where spiral dynamics will come in. And the deceitfulness of good, as we're going to show, is going to play itself out both in the individual, when you're going through the Enneagram perspectives, and it will, it also plays itself out in worldviews, and I'll go through that. The outside of the collective the is, lower right is the lower right quadrant. And in the lower right quadrant, what's the outside of a collective consciousness? Mm. It's artifacts. It's what a collective produces. So if I were an archaeologist on a dig and I found pottery... I found some type of writings or paintings, if I found weapons or tools, agricultural or otherwise, that would tell me what kind of culture I was studying. It would tell me about the consciousness of the culture or collective that produced it. So those are the quadrants, and we will be looking at both the individual and the collective, but primarily 
we're emphasizing in this series the individual, the internal upper left quadrant of individual consciousness. That's where I have my perspective as a nine, uh, where I come from uh, typically, and you would have yours as as a seven. And you're going to go through all the numbers, and we're going to look at how the deceitfulness of good would play itself out in those perspectives. Awesome. Awesome. Um, And I'm so glad you used that word, regression. Yes. Because in our transformation, we can transcend Mm -hmm. a previous mm, thought, Mm -hmm. worldview, Mm -hmm. and then sometimes we regress and we go back a little bit. I think that's so important to understand when I'm going to go through some of the Enneagram types, because what we see as good, and thus the title of this podcast, The Deceitfulness of Good, can be good. It is good. But then there's that time where we use it um, not in the healthy manner, is what I'll say, but I'll, I'll describe mm-hmm. this in a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then we, then we can regress or we can attach and stay stuck. We can stay stuck in a worldview mm-hmm. and we can stay stuck in a part of our, our type. So I wanted to just throw out this phrase that we all know. This is um, attributed to Carl Jung, and he said, what you resist persists. But the entirety of that quote is actually what you resist not only persists, but it will grow in size. Yeah. So why do I bring that up? What does that even mean in all of this? Um, so when we are looking at the individual at this point, we're going to use the Enneagram as our measure of our type for this one. And when you're studying the Enneagram, there are different words, and some of them are very confusing, and, but they've been part of the language for a very, very long time. So if you're looking at um, what is typically referred to as the passion, sometimes it's also called the vice. Mm-hmm. So we all have a passion mm-hmm. or a vice. <clears throat> but what I prefer to use is the word passion. And the reason is, and a part of this was I heard um, Beatrice Chestnut describe it this way. Passion comes from the word, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, but it's Latin. I can say spaghetti, but oh no, wait. <laughs> Sorry, close. there we go. Close. It's paseo, pas- okay. mm-hmm. So, like it, that word in Latin <laughs> means to suffer. Mm. And so, when I think about, okay, is this my vice or is this my passion? To me, a vice seems to be an outward action, where the passion, which is suffering, is inward. It's what I hold inside, and it might even seem good to suffer in silence or deny our suffering altogether. Yeah. Yes. So that's why I prefer to use that word. Um, <clears throat> people get wrapped up in the word vice. Sometimes they use the word sin, which I totally reject because um, I don't even see vice and sin as the same thing. So what we're going to do right now is Doug is going to hand the mic over to me unless he wants to jump in at any time here. And I'm just going to go through a few of the types to begin with. Um, I don't want to just go through all of the types quickly and not lay a really good foundation for what I see this um, deceitfulness of good in our types as. So yeah, and, and one thing I'll jump right in here and say, too, is to please, for Enneagram people that are listening to this, Please know that we'll probably go through some basics that are that you've known for probably years as an Enneagram person, but may be new to the presence audience that yeah. we're integrating into this. Uh, as a matter of fact, you have you had a call within the last week for some people that are within the presence community, and they were asking you where can they go to find a good test to find out what their type is, how can they learn more right. about the Enneagram. So, so we're dealing with a wide range of people here. Well, because... We're moving beyond old worldviews, yes. old ways of functioning, yes. Yes. and within this evolution, 
people are beginning to see beyond the walls of a collective. Right. And they're like, but what about me personally? Yes. And I mean, that's not new. We've had psychology for a long time. No, but a lot of times religions, which are part of worldviews, yes. don't necessarily get into personal transformation from the standpoint that you're talking about. Uh, oftentimes, for example, growing up, if you went to a therapist or especially a psychiatrist, yeah. that was kind of a strange thing. In other words, you had a, quote, problem. Right. This person has a problem. And it, it wasn't when, and of course, I grew up well, way before you, you know, in, you, in the uh, old so days. So far before and, me. And so back at that, <laughs> and in my day, uh, that, was, that was the way it works. Now, spirituality, transformation, these are universal words as we're all realizing it. So we're talking about this transformation that's happening within our consciousness. And, and what we really want to know is what are the things that prevent my growth and bring me this suffering you talked about? I want to know right. what that suffering is, how that suffering is caused, and how I can redirect and be transformed. You just casually threw that out, that spirituality and religion, like they go hand in hand. And um, we know, well, no, you didn't mean that. But what I'm saying is many decades ago, those would have been two separate yeah. things. Yeah. Um, so now we see that a spiritual growth path has nothing to do with religion, which is why I really would encourage you, if you haven't listened to part one of this, please go listen to that because it sets the tone for what we're going through here. Right. So yes, the Enneagram work is a spiritual work of the individual so, Doug and I have used this word on other podcasts. He uses it in presence um, a lot, and we've used it when we've spoken together on a previous Love Thy Number podcast, but we refer to something called the unworkable, yeah. and I've used that many times. So, let's see how the unworkable works hand in hand with this, the deceitfulness of good, okay? Excellent. All right, so let's start with type one. So, the passion... Again, the suffering for type one is anger. So just remember that. That's the passion. And back to the original quote, what we resist persists and grows inside. So type ones, they're called, often they're called the reformers. And as we know, they hold themselves to a very high standard. And they, they hold others to a high standard too. But internally, they hold themselves to the highest standard. So they are... They're such um, people who focus on the good. Reformers want to make things better. They themselves want to be good. And so the deceitfulness of the passion is that it seems good to be conscientious and ethical with a strong sense of right and wrong, right? Yep. Yes, that is good. But to be angry goes against what, it's, what seems to be good. So they resist that. They resist being angry. And then when others don't hold to the same standards of goodness, um, they, they begin, sometimes it, it builds up as resentment. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the anger of the one. And so um, that builds up because if, that, if things aren't going right, then I'll just be even better. Yes. And I'll work harder, and I'll suffer in silence with this resentment and this anger that other people are not getting in line like we think it, type one sh think it should be. And bless their heart, they're harder on themselves. So that anger often turns inward. And so if they believe they haven't lived up to their own standards, they just keep repressing and keep repressing. And so this relentless demand of that inner critic to be good and to do good at all times, it replaces personal needs and then their feelings shut down. So these would be people that uh, could come across as being very judgmental and that judgmental mindset would be actually turned inward. That oh, I would sure. be constantly judging myself in all these things. Yes. And so that desire to be good is mm. good. What's right? the payoff? What is it that, that the one, at the end of the day, what does the one want by being good? To be loved. 
To be loved. And what if I'm not good? That is the problem. I'm not loved. We are not loved. I'm not accepted. Right. And that can go with the people around you in your life, your family, Mm -hmm. your work environment. But when we get into a spiritual look at this, then they see themselves not worthy Yes. In God's eyes. Yes. And and that acceptance. There's nothing worse than, of course, this feeling of rejection in life whenever that happens and in whatever the circumstances. And one, I won't say one, there's actually two or three words that are now uh, really rubbing people the wrong direction. Those are words like creed, dogma, mm-hmm. yes, doctrine. And the reason why is because those are right and wrong terms. They belong to the blue meme traditional worldview. So from a collective side, if I were going to take this over to theology and speak in terms of a worldview that's very conscientious about good and evil, Mm -hmm. doing good, I would take this theologically over to uh, groups that probably most people out there would call fundamental right. or fundamentalist. And they are people that are very much always thinking in terms of judging right and wrong in themselves and especially in others. And that's where people really get driven away. But the reason why is it, there is a belief that what I do is going to determine my very acceptance by my higher power. Mm -hmm. Um, In in a religion, it could be God or whatever that higher power is called. And if if I'm not doing the right things, I'll be rejected. Yes. And so in a worldview, you could belong to some type of religion that's very strong on that. And actually what happens in many cases is that people actually become hypocritical because they don't want anybody to know they have things in their lives that they know are not where they want them to be or where they should be or their kids or or right. someone in their family and they feel shame over oh, that. My. Yes. And again that's where I see this is that suffering in yes. silence. And for the one who are just again to be called a reformer. Yeah. What a wonderful quality to have that you are You are dedicated to bringing out the best in yourself and in people and changing things that are not fair. There's a lot of inequity Mm -hmm. that is big in the conversation right now. We would be just so far less um, blessed, that's not the word I'm using, (laughs) if it wasn't for for type ones who did say, no, people, uh, we have to have certain Order. Order and laws. Mm-hmm. Laws are good things. Yep. Ones will often, um, like, I don't know, if there's a people speed in a neighborhood, mm-hmm. then they're the ones that will say, no, I'm going to take this to city council and we're going to put up a, a speed limit sign. There's children living in this neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So please, we're not going through each of the types right. to you know, go into depth about what each type, their qualities are, because... Right. You can learn those a lot of places. What yeah, I'm, and if you're new to this, you should. You, you you should do your work on on the Internet and find books that are going to help you get more in touch with this or get in touch with Danae through our info yes. line. So We're going to be doing yes. some um, online sessions, just studying the Enneagram in the next, uh, probably in the fall. Yep. So, again, ones are great, but when they... So the deceitfulness of good is that they don't is that see their if value. I do if I that's how I'm valued yes is by doing good is by getting it right is by having things in order yes is is by uh, having my life together and uh, if I do that then I'm expecting a payoff that I'll be accepted by others or loved or whatever. Right. And we okay. we talked in the last one about the human value. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a great place to introduce this again is just to say, to think that my value is tied to something that I have to do. Yes. And we talk a lot about doing and being. But yes. when, when type ones rest mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. knowing that it's okay 
Things mm-hmm. are not going to be perfect. Right. They are not going to be, I even hate to use that word perfect, because perfect, it just means whole. Right. And, and, and it's something we yeah. grow in. In, in. in other words, in, in our being, our identity, our true identity, I don't establish my identity through my doing. I'm a good person. Right. No. I, all people come with a God-given uh, image, a, a, a source from divine source. They come from perfection in that sense, from their divine source. But that is something in which we grow. Right. But we are just, we're not growing from a place of defect. Right. We're growing in our awareness of yes. the wholeness that we are yes. right where we are. Right where we are. And it won't, and it, and that wholeness will not be, will not be um, something that we have to accomplish or achieve uh, in order that we're not rejected. Bingo. That's, yeah. Boy, we're going to do good to get through. I don't know, maybe type three. <laughs> um, and that's okay because this yeah. is a series. We're doing this from our place. Uh, we own all the equipment. We can do as much as we want. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> yes. And we can do as many of these as we want to. And I have chocolate cake. If this doesn't go very well, we'll hang. We'll we'll end it and go have some cake. Exactly. Because life is uncertain. And if it does go well, we'll we'll Wait. go have some cake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that's the point of life. We're saying you can't lose. I this mean, is why we're yeah. we just really need to get along good. Because this it's is like, why she likes nines. Yes. Oh, especially a self pres nine. Yes. He's like cake. I'm exactly. there. Anyways, I was going to say my grandmother says life is uncertain. Eat dessert first. That's it. Okay. Moving on. I want to get to type two. Um, at least do this a little bit more today. Sure. So let me set this. What is the passion? The passion. Of type two is called pride. Now that just seems so opposite because all of us know type twos and they're the most giving, loving, caring people we know. They give of their love, they give their time. My goodness, we're going to talk about cake. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are just the greatest about if somebody has a a baby or Mm -hmm. if a neighbor's sick, they're they're getting together food trains and mm-hmm. or they're they're taking to people they are always focused on others and the fact of of what makes pride their passion which seems so opposite of somebody who's so focused on others is often they take pride in seeming to not have any needs of their own in fact they also kind of take pride in knowing what you need before you even need it, or anticipating that you'll need something so they'll be there uh, proactively. And how could that be a bad thing? It's not. People who are serving other people yep. and not self-centered, mm-hmm. that is a good thing. That is good. Right? That is good. So how could they be deceived by that good? Well, then they begin to see themselves as the source of what others need. And in fact, they deny that they even have needs of their own. Ah, so they ignore their own needs. They ignore. It's more than just ignore. It's that I can't. Mm. I have to be the one to provide for other people. Mm -hmm. And there's this, and this is a whole other conversation that I I want to have at another time, but it's called the holy ideas. But that... There's not enough Mm. help in the world. And if I let go of Mm. this and say, actually, I have some needs of my own, then there won't be enough. There won't be enough people, enough resource Mm. to take care. And so they begin to take that. That pride is that I am Mm. the one who is the provider of the help for people. And that's when the pride takes takes that where where the deceitfulness of good plays out in that pride thing is you can you can do so much for other people but when you think you're above needs that means honestly you believe you're above a divine the need 
of a divine source. Yes. That you are the source. Yes. And so that outward doing and mm-hmm. caring for others is, again, what gives them their sense of value. And identity. And identity. Yes. Identity. This is my identity. Just each one of the numbers then, what you're saying so I hear this, is each one of the numbers has got an identity that subconsciously, I guess, we all, we all develop yeah. based, based on the good that we see ourselves able to do or the thing that just comes naturally to us, that the deceitfulness of that good that comes naturally from us is that we can identify with it from a doing standpoint. And right. so, therefore, as long as I'm doing for, for others, then I keep up my identity. Yes. But if I don't do for others constantly, even to where your family's saying, you're wearing yourself out, you're, 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 you know, yeah. your health, you're, even your health is at stake. Why don't you, you know, take a vacation for you? Mm. No, I can't do that because that's just not what I identify that's, with. See, that's a very big distinguishing point. And you and I talked about this um, when we were at IEA Georgia about a year, a little over yeah. a year ago, right, mm-hmm. be- right before the the, the thing. world <laughs> the thing. stopped. Yes. But it can become this, I, for type one, I am the good person. Yes. I am. Yes. And again, that's your identity, mm-hmm. your source of acceptance, your source mm-hmm. of value, and ultimately, I am loved because I am mm-hmm. the one with the highest standards. Yes. Type two, I am the helpful one. Yes. Not I am helpful. I love being helpful. I am the one. Yes. And and you get and you get to a point, don't you, where you want to be recognized for that. Uh, even to where I would imagine when we start going down into the more dysfunctional parts of that, uh, I'm I might even get upset if I'm not recognized for what I'm doing for other people. Oh yes, that is a, that's a. That's a payoff. That's it is yes. It also becomes, um, it's where we regress. Okay, yes. I'll say that. Yeah. So instead of helping for the sake of helping, mm-hmm. you see yourself as it's what you call the payoff. And yes. then if I do enough of this, yes. then ultimately I will be taken care of. Yes. So I'm with you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes Mo- sense. Moving on a little bit. Um, we got time for another one. Okay. Yeah, we'll just do one more for, do one more today. for today. Let's do type three. Love, love, love my type threes. I love them all. Um, but type threes, what is the passion for type three? It is called... Now, a lot of times it's just called deceit. But what it really is, is self-deceit. Mm-hmm. And so type threes, my goodness, they are success driven. Yes. And they, oh my gosh, we wouldn't have, again, we wouldn't have um, much accomplished if it wasn't for these people that were like, yep, yep, I see what I want to do and I'm going to go get it done. Yes. Um, they're, they work really great with type sevens because we have a lot of ideas. I, I, I'll get uh, to this another. Yeah. Type sevens have all the ideas. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, not too good on execution. No, no, because there's always another idea and another idea. Right. That's the thing. Type threes, they're like, ah, I see what needs to be done. I'll get this done. Mm. And that's a great thing. Yes. It, so, but they tend to see that their worth is in their success. Mm. So to see their value, they equate that to um, how can I be successful? And shape... Shapeshifters. Type threes are called shapeshifters. Mm. I think that's great because they they will take on the role of what others need them to be at that time, mm. right? And so that seems good to be success driven, and it even seems good to be adaptable to the uh, to the needs of somebody you're working with or other people. Um, they adapt to what the environment demands of them, but they resist. Resting in their own authenticity, they resist knowing they are loved fully apart from their ex- external excess. So the self-deceit is, I 
am worthy because I take on this image. Mm-hmm. I get this. Uh, image is probably a big word, isn't it? Image is a big word. What for- kind of image do I present? Am I successful? We know that successful image. Yes. And a three would be very image driven, which is it wrong to be real successful Absolutely and have not. a great car, great house, a great this, a great that, and do really well in the thing that you do? Is that's not that's a good thing, right? To go out and really do great things. It really, really is. And I want to just make this point that sometimes people can become very critical of people who have wealth. Yes. And I've even seen Mm -hmm. an image that says, cast down the rich. Yes, right. Well, let me say, people who do not see their value Mm -hmm. in their external worth, Mm -hmm. we call these a lot of times philanthropists. Right. When you're going for, um, what is it, like, Funding, if you need. Yeah, yeah, the arts and and uh, the music. Uh, you you have the the philanthropist who's who's behind all of that. Yes. Yeah, but if you're filling out paperwork, you're trying to get a. Ah, I can't think of what it is. You know, a, to be funded for your sure. your project or whatever. Who do you think is going to fund that for you? Right. It's the people who have made uh, this success. Mm-hmm. But what happens is when they say that that's my identity. Yes. And there's that difference between I I am my wealth. Yes. I am the successful one. Yes. My value and people love me. Right. When I adapt to what they need me to be or I show up and take their idea and make it come to life. That's who that's who I am. Yes. I I think about even entertainers, musicians, others that hit the limelight. And um, there's even a a song, um, Don't You Know That You Are a Superstar? And all the world will love you just as long as you are. Uh, And that is this idea of I'm loved on behalf of this, the, the amazing accomplishments and achievements that I do. And... Oftentimes, you're stunned if you hear of someone that's a famous person that uh, had some terrible thing or they harmed themselves or, mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like, how, how could that happen? They have everything they in the world. All. They had it all. They had all, everything but love and acceptance. Right. And so that's, what, that's where the self-deceit yeah. becomes so detrimental to them is thinking, I can't be loved right. just as I am am right, right here. What if I lose all my success? What if I lose that amazing job, career? What if I fall on my face? What if I have to ask for help? Mm. Uh, and I'm the achiever. I'm the one that gets it all done. There are just so many ways that then at that point you realize that uh, you've identified. Yes. You've identified with the achievement and that is the deceitfulness of Good yes. achievement. Yeah. Oh, well, I think that's that's a lot to take in right now because you've introduced the quadrants, and um, I could show you a map, but it's just like a big pl- plus sign. <laughs> it's just that four quadrants, and we are talking about when we're talking about the upper left, we're talking about our internal conscious evolution, and that's where the enneagram sits. But all of them work together. So we can talk more about um, the integral aspect of this next time. And I do want to go on with the other types. I guess we'll start with type four next time. Yeah, that's good. We'll just go in order. One, two, three, four. Okay. Well, then for today, I hope you all rest in knowing that just like you are right this very moment, is utter perfection, and you are loved. Until next time, peace out. I'll cut the cake. (laughs) I love him. (laughs) Bye.